Hey guys, welcome to this video on the fundamental theorem of calculus. Woo! It's gonna be the best day ever. It's very exciting. <laughs> okay. All right, sorry, sorry. Okay, so as you can tell, I get very stoked about this because it's like you spend a whole semester building up to this. So let's talk about a little business here before I actually jump into this. Like I said, there's part one and there's part two. So for all of this, I'm going to be proving this and kind of showing you kind of this, this very cool result, but you should already understand the concept of Riemann sums using definite integrals to calculate area. And then you should also already know something about antiderivatives. If you don't, you are definitely going to want to make sure you've got a, a solid base of those things um, before you jump into this. Otherwise, this might not totally make sense. Okay, so let's jump into it. Before I go into the fundamental theorem of calculus, we need another theorem. This kind of just lays some groundwork uh, for what I need to do later on. So I'll state it, the, the mean value theorem. Um, so you might remember this from earlier in Calc 1. So we also have it for definite integrals. So it says if f is continuous on a closed interval, then there is a point c in that closed interval where f of c will equal the average value of a function. So if you are not familiar with this, um, I do have some videos just talking about this, but I can briefly kind of summarize what this, this right side means. This is literally calculating the average value of all of the, or the, the average of all the values that a function attains on a particular closed interval. So that, that's what this side actually means. So how would I actually use this? Just to make sure you're a little familiar with this. So here's a situation. So let's pretend I've got a, a, a definite integral and I know that it equals zero. So according to the mean value theorem, there should be this point in that closed interval from A to B where F of C equals zero. So how can I actually figure out if that's true or not? Okay, so here's how I can kind of show that. So by using this result, so F of C, according to what I just showed you in the mean value theorem, if I, if I write this down, so let me write that down. So F of C equals one over b minus a times the definite integral, so times this. So does this have to equal zero? That's going to be the question. And the answer is yes, absolutely. So remember, at the beginning of this problem, I said that this is a fact. So if that's a fact, then I can just invoke that right in here and rewrite this. So what this means is I have one over B minus A now times zero. So all of this will equal zero. Therefore, I know that there has to be some C where this will actually work out. So that would be like one way that you could kind of in invoke that particular theorem. So now let's discuss the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And I got to set this up. So we're going to start with some function, so little f of t, this is going to be some integrable function on a closed interval from a to b. And then I'm going to introduce x. So x is some value that falls within this closed interval. Now from these two things, I'm going to create a new function. So we're going to define this f of x equal to this definite integral. So I would first recommend maybe just pausing and, and writing this all down and then hit play when you've written that all down. And then I'm going to show you what this actually means. So what this is trying to get at is, uh, I, can, I think it's easiest if I just draw a picture. So let's just pretend that this is an, a non-negative function just to make our lives easier. So I've got this function f of t, okay? And this is defined on this interval from A to B. So here's my, um, here's maybe my A and here's my B. So what this function is doing then is it's taking this and it's calculating basically the area under the curve from A to X where X is somewhere in, in this interval. Okay. So if I, I can just set X wherever I want. So I'll just for, for funsies, we'll just set it here. So there's my X. So then this definite integral is basically calculating like this area in here. Okay. 
So that's what that means. So we have this f of x function that is a definite integral that talks about computing area. And at this point, there, there might be like a few questions kind of on your, your mind. How do we even figure out what this is? And definite integrals, when we talk about it, we, we're always talking about like the area above the x-axis. And it seems so weird when you talk about definite integrals because it's like, is it related to indefinite integrals? And that's something we're going to cover in this video. And then also this, this function here, another question that I, I kind of wonder about it is, is this function, is it differentiable? And this would actually be a, a very interesting thing to think about because like I said, we think about definite integrals from the standpoint of area. We don't think about area having anything to do with derivatives, right? Derivatives are like rates of change. So it would be actually pretty interesting if this integral, which I know has this definite integral has to do with area, if this now has some sort of connection to derivatives. So this is where we start. So I really want to think about this f prime of x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute f prime of x. And just looking at our function, one more time to point it back out to you, this function here, we don't have some nice convenient derivative formula to just spit out the derivative for us. So we're going to have to go back to the basics and we're going to have to use the formal definition of a derivative to help us figure this out. So I've got f prime of x equals, so what I want you to do, actually, I want you to pause the video. This is a great place to test yourself. Can you remember the formal definition of a derivative? So go ahead and fill this in, hit play when you're ready. So this will be the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x, all of this over h. So now what I want to do is I want to think about wh what is this f of x plus h minus this f of x. So let's bring back this graph for a moment and here's my f of t and let's actually figure this out. So this goes once again from, so here's my a, here's my b. So let's just start with what is this f of x. So that would mean then that I set some point here, so we'll say this is x. This is computing this area here, okay? And then I'll do this f of x plus h in pink. So let me, I don't know, I'll, I'll set it like someplace just to the, the, the right. And let me just compute this area here. And what I want you to like figure out just visually here, what does this difference actually equal? Well, the part with the overlap would go away, right? So I'm actually just left with this part from x to x plus h. So if I if I just want to zero in on that for a second, so I've got my x and my x plus h. So this is what I'm actually left with, right? This little piece in here. So I can rewrite this difference then as this, right? I can't represent this difference now using the function, but I can represent this difference actually using an integral. So let me clear some room. And now we can actually write out this result. So I've got this limit as h approaches zero. Let me bring the h just out in front here, this, this one over h, I'm bringing this out in front so I can just rewrite the top. So we found that this really is now the integral from x to x plus h of f of t dt. So here's where, where I, what I was left with. Okay, so now here's where that mean value theorem actually comes into play. This actually is an application of the mean value theorem. So if I just go back and I remind you just the average value of a function for a moment. So this is the average value of a function, right? So think about now computing this for what I have. So I have this integral, so just to remind you first, I have x to x plus h of f of t dt. So I know it's slightly different letters, but think about this difference here. If I take one over 
x plus h minus x, right? That would be literally using kind of this b minus a, except now I've just changed it to, to these limits of integration. So this whole bottom part will just leave me with h, right? So this actually looks a lot like the average value of a function, or more importantly, I can invoke what I know about the mean value theorem. So what this tells me, according to the mean value theorem, there is some c in this interval here that will equal this. So let me just note that. Okay, so by the mean value theorem, there's gonna be some c within this interval from x to x plus h where this, and maybe I should be more clear, what do I mean by this? This, this will equal f of c. That is what the mean value theorem just told us. So what I'm going to do then is I'm just going to rewrite all of this. This is going to look a little strange. I'm going to I'm going to just warn you. So look a little strange. So I've got the limit as x or h approaches zero now. All of this now equals f of c. Hmm. Okay. So now I have to really think about this idea of this limit within this interval. So if I'm thinking about c in x to x plus h when h is going to zero then then remember that's when h is going to zero so what's actually happening here then this is no longer going to be c in some interval this is just going to be c in this from x to x well if you have this closed interval what this like this this, this is almost nonsensical this means that c just equals x so the limit of this thing here when i start thinking about what happens as h approaches zero this will all just equal, let, let me clear some space. This will all just equal, ultimately, f of x. So remember, where did we start with? We started with f prime of x. What does f prime of x equal? It equals f of x. Wasn't that exactly what I was trying to prove? Does this equal this? Yes, it does. We just proved it, actually. And so, this is a pretty great result. This means there is a connection between derivatives and definite integrals. And it's very surprising, actually, because it just seems like when you're approaching the two topics, it's like derivatives are talking about one thing. They're talking about rates of change. Definite integrals is talking about something else. It feels like it's talking about area. Just the very idea of the two things doesn't seem like it's con connected, but the fundamental theorem of calculus basically creates and, sa and says there is a connection between the two things. So this is awesome. Okay, so let's, let's state now the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. So here it is. So it says, if f is continuous in a closed interval, then f of x, defined by this function, which we, we looked at in depth, this is continuous on the closed interval and its derivative is f prime of big f prime of x equals little f of x. So this is what we just did. We actually just did the whole proof of everything that goes into this. So this is this is awesome. This is great. And there's usually like one particular question that comes up a lot with this. So I do want to I want to go through that with you. So I have many more examples of kind of how to do this, but just to cover one of the, the basic questions that comes up with this. You might be asked to find dy dx where you have some function defined by the integral. So according to the fundamental theorem of calculus then, so it, it's all going to be about um, kind of your, your limits of integration. That's one of the big things that you have to pay attention to. But if you're trying to take the derivative of this, then this is really just as simple as plugging in f of x when, when it's in this form. So this means then my dy dx is going to equal, I just plug in x, x to the fifth plus one, and that's all I have to do with that one. So that's that's it. Okay, so now let's let's bring back the music. Woo! <laughs> okay, so this is just the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So I do have the next part, which is maybe even better. <laughs> so hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video. And if you're looking for examples more of what I was showing you in that last example, I have lots more with that too. So thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful. I'll see you next time.